pastor of the original Philadelphia Missionary Baptist Church, moderator Christian Unity Baptist Association, Chicago, Illinois. So let's receive him, the great NBCA. Amen. If you love God, give God great praise. Try again. That was okay for a practice run. If you love God, give God a great praise. Someone in the middle. How we thank God for life, health, and strength, and for the joy of being in worship one more time. God is good. Almost got it. God is good. Amen. All the time, God is good. To our president, Dr. Talbert, to his cabinet officers, to host Pastor Kemp co-hosts, pastors, state presidents, my state president, Dr. Joe Taylor, moderators, pastors, all of you who love the Lord. It's good to be alive and to know it. Amen. Last night, uh, Pastor Gardner must have uh, peeked or peeked into my notes because I'm coming from the same particular passage he was last night there in what we call the Aoptic Gospel, John chapter 4, uh, verses 20 through 24. I won't read them because of sake of time, but tonight I'm going to deal with uh, the biblical response or, or authentic, authentic worship done biblically. And before we can even do worship, we must first define worship. What is Worship. Well, in the Greek, it means to bow with your face toward the ground, to give obeisance to, or to submit to someone who is over you. William Temple defines worship this way. He says to worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, and to devote the will to the purpose of God. We who are saved, we are all worshipers, created to bring glory, honor, and pleasure to the God who made us. Worship comes also from this Anglo-Saxon word, worth-ship which suggests, as Louis uh, Giglio says in the book, The Air I Breathe, we worship that we deem worth it, or what we find value in. So that which we value is that we will worship. And worship, you all, is not just a Sunday thing. Let me try again. I said worship is not just a Sunday thing. It should be an everyday occurrence if you are a child of God. Now, when you consider the fact that God really is worthy, microphone check one, two. When you consider the fact that God is worthy, it should not take pumping and pushing and priming and pulling to get the people of God to worship the God who deserves our worship. God is not somewhere hiding. He's not like a needle lost in a haystack. He's not some theological construct. He is a God who is ever present and active in our lives and again deserves our worship. And when the subject of worship comes up, the stakes are high because God holds worship at a high value. And since God does, so should we. Worship begins with God. It ends with God. And you know, we're here in John 4, you know Jesus had to go to Samaria. He could have 
went another route, but he chose to go through Samaria. He had an appointment with this wayward woman at the well. So why all the fuss about Samaria? Because Samaritans hated Jews. Jews hated Samaritans. But he had to go and deal with this woman. They had this religion, Samaritans, it was a half-breed religion. A mixture of heathen religion with the Jews' religion. And when the Jews would not permit the Samaritans to worship at the temple in Jerusalem, they said, hey, we'll build our own temple. So Samaria to the Jew was an unlovely place. But Jesus goes to an unlovely place because the people there needed help. False worship is selective, ignorant, superstitious. But idol worship is irrelevant and an insult to the nature of God. So what, 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 what do we see? Discovering authentic worship. Well, first of all, when you do it authentically, you focus on the right place. The place is no longer the temple or a particular location. Jesus is saying to us, since you're saved and the worshiper, worship can and should occur wherever you are. Okay. See, if you only worship God in a church or your church, <laughs> that says that your worship really ain't real. And if you're like me, my best worship often ain't at church. Mine is often at the house. Sometimes when I'm driving down the street, I have to pull over because my mind gets to thinking about how good God is. And if I keep on, my eyes become filled with tears and I have to stop and give him the worship that he deserves. You may even be in Walmart aisle number seven. <laughs> Thanking God for the fact that you have some money to pay for your stuff. So don't get caught up on a particular location, but bless him wherever you are. Not only should you focus on the right place, but also on the right principles. Jesus here revealed, revealed the truth to this woman in verse 22. She does not even know what it was that she worshiped. She, she had a religion because of her fathers and their traditions. She thought she was truly worshiping God. But there can be no real worship apart from salvation. He draws, Jesus does, a comparison between the intelligent worship of uh, the, the, the Jews and the ignorant worship of these Samaritans. And listen, I don't want to ever come to church and simply go through the motions. I want to have a God encounter. I want to experience God while I'm in worship. Not only do we focus on the right place and the right principles, but thirdly, there is the right purpose. See, when we worship God with the right purpose, we're not worshiping in order to get something from Him. We're trying to give something to Him. You know that your worship is real when you can do it without knowing the results. I don't worship God just because of what he's done. I worship God because he's God. No, I missed that. <laughs> See, if he never gives me another blessing, He's still God. Okay. If I don't get the job, he's still God. A preacher 
If you don't get to church, he's still God. If he doesn't heal your body, he's still God. And God deserves our worship. So there is the right place, the right principles, the right purpose. And lastly, there is the right person. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must do it in spirit and in truth. Authentic worship involves an inward change of heart, not just an outward observance. True worshipers follow God in complete sincerity. Who do you worship? Or how often is it in our churches that we seek to be worshipped ourselves? Worship leaders, singers, preachers, we're guilty of sometimes demanding that folk worship us. But we're wrong. Only God. I wish I had y'all talking to me here. Only God deserves the worship. Again, because he's worth it. He's worthy of it. There's a song recorded by a choir back home in Chicago that says, you don't know my story. All the things I've been through. You can't feel my pain. What I had to go through to get here. You'll never understand my praise. So don't try to figure it out. Here's why. Because my worship mm -hmm, is for real. I've been through too much. I wish I had somebody not to worship him. I've been through too much. Not to bless his name. And when I think about it, how good he is. I can't help it. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, how we thank you for being God and good. Thank you for loving us unconditionally. Bless now we pray, oh God, this worship experience. Have your way. Bless the preacher. Bless the choirs. Save the lost sinner. Strengthen the saint in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so very much. At this time, we're going to have a welcome. Reverend Jerry Daly, pastor of Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church here in the great city of San Antonio, Texas, and also the chairman of Community of Churches for Social Action. Let's receive him with a great saint. Uh, amen. Shall we say a great amen? amen. Let's say amen again. Amen. Thank God for the privilege of worship. Amen. Praise is what I do. Amen. To our esteemed president, Dr. Talbot, our general secretary, Dr. Dixon, our presiding worship leader, Dr. Banks, to all of the officers, messengers, auxiliary leaders of this, our National Baptist Convention of America. Another day's journey. If you're not, you surely ought to be glad about it. Just to be here and having experienced what we've experienced to our host pastor, Dr. Kim, co-host pastors William and Nelson. It's a privilege to be able to do what I have been tag to do. On Monday, our host pastor, Dr. Kemp, talked about community and the significance and the importance of churches coming together, being able to do more together than any one church can do alone. 
care how strong you are, we can do more together than any one singular church can do alone. And I wanted tonight to put that to practice with regards to the welcome. I'm a part of this convention. I've been a part of it since elementary school in the children's division. Fourth generation pastor in this convention. And how I praise God. It would be easy to welcome you to our city where God has truly blessed us. But I wanted to put on display what Dr. Kemp talked about in terms of collaboration and partnership. And so I have asked our vice chairman, who is newly elected bishop of the Church of God in Christ. Come on and say amen. In fact, we're going to celebrate his appointment in his election on Friday night. And so I thought it fitting and right for our vice chairman who has been so faithful, loyal and dedicated to come and to even on the last night to say a welcome from the community of churches for social action. Would you receive Bishop Jeffrey Stirrup of the Dominion Church of God in Christ as he comes and welcomes from CCSA. Thank you, Chairman Daly, to the President, Dr. Talbert, host pastor, Dr. Kemp. We praise God for, for this opportunity. 1999, Dr. E. Thurman Walker, he had a vision and a passion for community. His vision and compassion for community was inspirational. It was contagious. It was so contagious and so inspirational until it reached across denominational lines. It pulled in Methodist churches. It pulled in Church of God in Christ. It pulled in non-denominational churches. It pulled in churches all across this city. Even though there are many things that we may not have in common, one thing we definitely had in common, we wanted to serve people. We wanted to be a voice for the community. We wanted to help people. We wanted to bring people together in this community. His passion and his leadership formed the community of churches of social action. At his passing, it went under the leadership of Pastor Herman Price, and today we're under the leadership of Dr. Daly, and the and community of churches of social action is reaching people. This year, this, this past year, we exceeded over $2 million in scholarships that we gave out in this community. The children in this community, the community of churches of social action did this. Pastors coming together of different denominations. We praise God for the leadership we have now, and we thank God for these churches. I tell you, I, I'm, I'm so excited about being a part of this organization because it, is, it has enabled me to meet pastors and become friends with pastors that I probably would have never met before, and I thank God for it. I want to welcome you to San Antonio, Texas. The National Baptist Convention, welcome to San Antonio, Texas, and may God bless you. And I pray that great impartation takes place during this convention because of your presence. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so very much. We feel very welcome here in the city of San Antonio. Let's acknowledge the arrival of our great visionary leader. Dr. Samuel Tauber. <laughs> this time we have reports of some boards tonight. Uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Malone, or his representative of the Youth Convention, to come. And follow him will be the MMBB board. And then we'll have a report from the Church Growth and Development Board. Come in that order, please. Good evening. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We bring you greetings from the Youth and Children's Convention. Give our children a hand. 
Youth and Children's Convention is from the age of three to the age of 24. We look forward to having you and your children come in a strong way. We're looking for at least, y'all ready to repeat after me? At least, least. 2,000 2000. young people. If we can make it happen, let's clap tonight. Come on, we can do better than that. And Mr. President asked me to say some things, and I asked him uh, if I could have a greater representative. And that greater representative tonight is a young lady who I baptized, the first child I baptized as pastor of St. John, the third female president of our Youth and Children's Convention who drove here while working on her master's in human resources at South Tex at Texas State University has finished her bachelor's and is our president. Let's receive our national youth. And this is our other pastor, Pastor Daly. Sister Jabria Gentry, come on, give her a hand. To President Talbert, um, his cabinet members, officers, auxiliary leaders, good evening. I've had a wonderful time this week and as, as I've learned and fellowshiped with you all during the sessions and the meetings with each of you. I love seeing all of your new faces. Um, and thank you, President Talbert, for giving me this opportunity to speak um, to the Congress about our youth and children's convention. We're so excited and we're so ready. We have so many things planned because we are here for the children. And I knew when I was growing up as a little child going to competitions, that was like my fun for the summer. So I wanna bring that back and I want this to be the best that it could ever be. I also wanna thank my director for his leadership and his staff for assisting the youth officers and myself with all their hard work. We plan throughout the entire year, conference calls, any way that we can, and our hard work, and it, we became a family. And I love that about us. Um, we're extremely excited about our convention destination to New Orleans, Louisiana. And we're planning many activities. So we have a community service project. We actually are gonna partner with the Boys and Girls Club. So we have a toy drive actually that we're going to have that all um, children can participate in. And we're also going to have our youth officers and our staff actually go and meet with the kids, maybe do some obstacles, fun little activities for the children. Um, we also have various competitions, old and new, ministry workshops, also Monday night activities for the children, just a bunch of fun, but we're gonna do it in the name of the Lord. And then also we have our Wednesday night musical, so we're gonna be praising God in song, and then much more to enrich and captivate our children and youth's minds about the importance and rewards of knowing and serving our Lord. So please try to register as early as possible. Early registration is thank you and welcomed as much as possible for your youth and children. Um, our theme this year is I live, I praise, I worship. Our supporting scriptures, Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. And also John 4:24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I live, I praise, I worship. And I challenge you to live praise and worship and let's teach our children to live and praise and worship thank you again for this opportunity come on let's give a hand join us in new orleans louisiana come on representative of the MMBB here tonight. Church Growth and Development Board.
Good evening. First of all, uh, to President Talbert and to all the members of the convention, the protocol has already been established. I am uh, honored by Dr. Talbert that he has asked uh, me to become the secretary treasurer of uh, this board. Uh, I have shared with him that I believe that there are so many others who are so much better qualified to do so, and yet I'm the person that God laid on his heart. And so I will certainly do the very best that I possibly can uh, to represent him and this convention. I am also uh, so pleased that he has partnered uh, me with Pastor William Watson and also Pastor uh, John Brooks is going to be working along with us as well. We did have an initial meeting today to begin to discuss uh, directions that we'd like to go. One of the first things that we would like to do is we'd like to hear from the members of the convention. And so what we're going to do in the next few weeks is seek to develop either a link to the convention's website or develop a website where you can go online, you can communicate with us, you can share with us what your concerns are, what your dreams and hopes are as it relates to the uh, Church Growth and Development Board. Uh, we want to be in a collaborative effort with you as I look out among us and as I think of all uh, that are represented by this convention, there's a wealth of wisdom and experience and all of us need one another. And so therefore, our view, our vision for what we've been asked to do is to simply work with everybody else so that we might strengthen every church that's a part of this convention. And also that we might reach outside the convention to those churches who are not a part of a convention and invite them to join in with us. All that God has invested in you, he has invested in us through you. And we realize that the experiences that God has given unto you can be useful to us in helping us to help churches grow stronger. And so I want to uh, plead with you uh, to not sit back and watch us, but rather to join us. I want to uh, plead with you not to take the gifts that God has given unto you and keep them to yourself, to yourself, because the Bible teaches that the spirit of spirit, the gifts of the spirit rather, were given to profit the body with all. And so God has invested greatly in you, so that you can invest greatly in us. Again, I am fully cognizant and aware uh, of the fact that I am very limited in what I'm able to do and what I uh, know and the resources that I have. But that's why I believe that since God has asked me through President uh, Talbot. But told uh, to do this, then God knows what gifts you have. And I believe that as it relates to this convention, we have everything we need to do everything that needs to be done through the Church Growth and Development Board. So I invite you to join with us and help us. We'll let uh, Pastor Watson share if he desires. All right, so again, we're just getting started our very first meeting today. We do plan on meeting uh, on next month, and by the time you see us in June, we plan on having information that will be made available to you that we believe will be of great benefit uh, to you. Again, we certainly do ask for your prayers, and both of us, I believe I can say, uh, along with uh, Pastor John Brooks, are honored for the confidence that the President and the Convention has placed in us. Thank you so very much. At this time, will you stand with me as we receive the greatest convention president anywhere, our own visionary leader, Dr. Samuel Talbot, as you come and share with us. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Is Dr. Foster of Chicago in the building? I guess not. This week has been a wonderful week, and I keep saying it over and over again, but we want to thank this host committee, the members of this church, Antioch Missionary Baptist Church, under the leadership of Dr. Kenneth Kemp, and all of these pastors and churches here in San Antonio that have done an excellent job in helping us uh, to have a great meeting this week. Uh, to all of our officers and members, to our special guests tonight, uh, I would like to share with you that upon my arrival uh, Sunday evening, uh, I was informed that the president of the Baptist University of Americas, uh, where Dr. Jerry Daly has served on the Board of Trustees some uh, eight years. Uh, it has been a university that has been dealing a lot with the Hispanic population. The president wanted to meet with me, and of course, he probably didn't know. You don't just tell me you want to meet with me, because I'll meet with you at midnight if I have to. 
especially if it's about working the better, working together to improve uh, our, our churches and what we're trying to do. And so we met on Monday uh, with the president, uh, Dr. Abe, and I promised him I would not try to pronounce his last name. Uh, and he could not be here tonight because of a scheduled conflict, but he has sent the chief of staff, uh, Dr. Cortez, who's going to come tonight and give us some brief remarks from the Baptist University of Americas. There was a large Hispanic population in Texas and even growing in Louisiana and many other places. And our churches, in many cases, just like Antioch, uh, is located in communities where a lot of our Hispanic brothers and sisters are moving in. And we need to find better ways to minister to them. Uh, and they could be a partner to help us learn how to do that. Dr. Cortez. Thank you, Dr. Tolbert, for the opportunity to be here. Dr. Daly, good to see you, known you for a long time. Uh, long time trustee for Baptist University of the Americas. We're just honored to be here, blessed to be here, blessed to be able to share with you a little bit about our school. Uh, Dr. Tolbert said, my name is Gabriel Cortez. I serve our chief of staff at bring you greetings from Dr. Abraham Hakes, uh, our president, and I uh, just want to share a little bit about our school. We've been around since 1947. Uh, we began as uh, an institute, uh, just focused on, on training uh, pastors, uh, primarily from Mexico. And through the years, uh, things has, have evolved, and the Lord has done uh, great things in and through our school. In uh, 2003, uh, we became an accredited university. We received a certification from the state to grant degrees and became accredited by the Association for Biblical Higher Education. And since then, uh, the Lord has allowed us to offer a bachelor's in Bible and theology uh, here in San Antonio. And uh, we praise God for that. And, uh, and the Lord has allowed us to add even more degrees after that, uh, one in uh, business, uh, leadership, one in music, uh, one in human behavior. Uh, but all of those have a strong uh, foundation in Bible and theology. Uh, three uh, things that we say that BOA is about, we're about, we're affordable. And that's something I want to make sure that I communicate out to you. Uh, we charge $230 uh, per credit hour, uh, a full-time education uh, with uh, housing. It's somewhere around four to $5,000. And if you, have, you know what school costs out there, uh, especially in private uh, schools, uh, especially even Christian schools, uh, you know the four to five thousand dollars a year uh, is definitely a, a huge blessing uh, from God. So, uh, so we're thankful to God that we are able to be affordable. We're biblical. Uh, we're based on the scriptures. And I think more now than probably ever, we're founded on the Word of God, and we stand by the Word of God. And uh, we believe that our students need to know the Word of God. And then lastly, we're cross-cultural. We are a pretty diverse uh, student body. Uh, we need to be a lot more diverse. We've talked about that with Dr. Daly. And uh, right now we have basically students from all races. We have about 18 countries uh, represented uh, in our campus. And just uh, uh, we're about uh, reaching out to the nations and uh, equipping men and women to know how to reach out to the nations and a minister among those that God has called you to to serve and that uh, we're just blessed to to be here blessed to share about our school I have some information with me if anybody wants some I can share that with you and again we're honor we're blessed to be here Dr. Tolbert thank you very much yes and um, before you leave uh, the calls per semester uh, yes, it's uh, per, per, for the whole year, it's $4,370. Uh, you split that in two, you know, about $2,100, $2,200 uh, per semester, including the, the full-time tuition, which is 12 hours, and then the, the housing. Uh, meals are not included, but all the apartments have a kitchen, and we try to find as many opportunities as possible to provide free food for our students. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's yeah. kind of where we're at. As you had said, 45,000, I knew that was, yeah, it's 4,500. Yeah, they're for, yeah, 4,370 to be exact. Okay, so, all right. Yeah. Sure. Well, thank, thank you yeah. very much. All right, thank, thank you, thank you. Much. My pleasure. He said more affordable and said 45,000, but that's what I do. 
uh, you try to count up because maybe that's the amount he just raised today or something. You know? <laughs> but we're glad to, to look at a potential partnership. Uh, Dr. Brandon Dumas may be in the building. Stand up, Dr. Dumas. Dr. Dumas is special assistant to NBCA's president, but he's also the vice president of student affairs and athletic director at Wiley College. And uh, I've asked Dr. Dumas to be the point person to work with uh, Dr. Cortez and Dr. Abe on a potential uh, partnership with their school. So he's the point person uh, that you all will be talking to. At this time, we're now back in the hands of Dr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. President, for your visionary leadership and our collaborative efforts. At this time, we are graced tonight to have this great choir uh, under the leadership of, of a Floridian by way of Jacksonville, Florida. And so we're delighted to have the Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church Choir. We're going to allow them to come now and share with us music ministry. Let's receive them with a great amen. And praise the Lord, everybody. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Well, we're glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Amen. All the dignitaries have been established in protocol. How many know that the Spirit of the Lord is in this place? And we know that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You're free to lift your hands. You're free to give God glory. But if you know God is here and he can meet your needs, somebody shout glory. glory. Amen. Psalm says, and we are glad. Yes, we are glad. with us. Lord, you're worthy. We give you glory. Hallelujah. You get the Hallelujah. Lord, you're holy. Let's sing, Lord, we end on. Let's sing, for, for you have done. Come on, lift your hands and say, you've done great things. We can say, Lord, Clap your hands with it. And we are. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we are glad. Yes, we are. What everybody say, hallelujah. Lord, you're worthy. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give it to him. You can the. We sing hallelujah. You are holy, God. Let's sing, Lord. I need to help everybody For you have done Come on, sing it from your heart Done great things The Lord has done many, many great things When I look back over my life You've done great things Well, let's say And we are hard glad Yeah, 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 yeah And we are hard glad we are, and we are, we are. I thank you, God, for the many, many great 
last time. And we are, and we, yes we are, yes we are. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. How many are glad out there? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let's uh. Amen. I believe we 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 in a we in a good church. In a good church. Go to A flat. I grew up in a, in a Baptist church and and I would grow up hearing songs always talking about the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. I know it works because it saved me. I know it works because it raised me. I know it works because it healed me. I know it works because it filled me. So I said, it will never, ever, ever lose its power. Tell somebody the blood still works. Come on, put your churchy voice on and say the blood still works.
God for the Macedonia Baptist Church Choir, Reverend Jerry Daly Pastor. I'm glad to see uh, a pastor here in San Antonio, uh, Dr. Kemp, that grew up in Lake Charles, Pastor Paul Stevens. Amen. Great to see him here tonight. present the introducer and before we close tonight I'm going to ask that Dr. Banks would have Dr. Earl Pleasant who has been a vice president of our convention who is now the advisor to the president he would do my closing remarks tonight all the way from Los Angeles California some time ago, I was here preaching here at Antioch, and Dr. Kemp introduced me to some of the pastors, and one of them in particular uh, that I remember is Dr. Robert Jemison, who is the pastor of the Second Baptist Church here in San Antonio, Texas. It's hard to forget him once you meet him. Y'all know what I'm talking about. If you need uh, church service, he can help you. If you need funeral service, his wife can help you. He's just an all-around great guy. And I've asked him, uh, because uniquely the National Baptist Convention of America, our chaplaincy commission is headed by Dr. Jared Daly here in San Antonio for the commissioning of chaplains. And uh, Dr. Robert Jemison, does the same thing in the Progressive National Baptist Convention, and they're both in San Antonio. So I've asked him to come tonight to present our guest speaker, right. Dr. Robert Jones. And all the people of God said amen. amen. And those who were not afraid shouted hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, hallelujah. Yeah. President Tarver. General Secretary Dixon. Host Pastors Kemp and Nelson. Distinguished clergy. My brothers and sisters, co-workers in ministry, how thankful I am for the opportunity to come and to share with you an introduction of my former president, the immediate past president of Progressive National Baptist Convention, the Reverend Dr. James C. Perkins. Dr. Perkins has served as pastor of Greater Christ Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan for over 38 years. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Wiley College, Marshall, Texas. His Master of Divinity degree from Andover Newton Theological Seminary, Newton, Massachusetts his Doctor of Ministry degree from United Theological Seminary, Dayton, Ohio. Dr. Perkins is a great proclaim of God's word, speaking God's word in these United States and abroad. He is the author of a number of books, one book, Building Up Zion's Walls, 
He saw the need to ensure that there was housing for those persons, low income and his church. They went to work with the city and government to build housing for those underprivileged persons. Not only did he see the need to build housing, but also to work on the cognitive skills of our youth and started a school for boys from elementary all the way to high school, thus educating not just the youth of Detroit, but the youth of our nation and the youth of our global society. He has been honored by Black Enterprise USA Today, Ebony, American Baptist, the African American Pulpit. And when you hear him, you will know that he is scholarly in his preaching, but also spiritual in his delivery. In addition, Dr. Perkins has served on numerous boards. He is a past president of the Mission Progressive Baptist Convention, a member of the Detroit Baptist Pastors Council, NAACP. And I really hate to say this, but he's a member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity. <laughs> He should have been a member of Alpha Phi Alpha. Some folk just can't make the grade. He's a member of the Board of Trustees of his alma mater, Wiley College. He's doing a great work in enhancing the quality of life and the quality of education and the quality of spirituality for those persons who go to Wiley College. I've enjoyed working with him for the past 25 years, watching him move around the convention, and God elevated him to be the president and to be the shepherd of over three million persons, part of that great convention. An excellent preacher, part of his excellency is because he's married to a beautiful woman, Linda Atkins Perkins, father of two beautiful daughters. One lives in Houston, may be a candidate for your church. I wish she lived in San Antonio, but she does not. Thank you. I need every blessing I can get. <laughs> Finally, I need to say to you, if you, if you pray, he'll preach. Amen. If you do not pray, he'll still preach. <laughs> because like the prophet Jeremiah, it's like fire yes. shut up in his bones. Thank you for having my president my friend, to come to this city and to share in this annual session. Honored, and you will be blessed by his preaching. The reason why I know he can preach is because he has preached to me. Hallelujah. 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 Can I get a hallelujah over here? Hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Before the word comes, where are the worshipers? It was real quiet. All the worshipers. We're going to sing one last selection. When the saints go to worship, I know that there's power when you worship. Things can be canceled when you worship. Bodies can be healed when you worship. 
every trap of the enemy is forfeited when you worship. So we're going to say this on when the saints go to where Sister Hope Forte is going to come and bless us. Amen.
illustrious, the venerable, the erudite pastor of this great, uh, president of this great convention, Dr. Talbert, and to the entire officiary of the National Baptist Convention of America, and to our host pastor, Dr. Kemp, and to this celestial conclave of clerics gathered here beneath this sacred dome, and to all of you, my sisters and brothers in the Commonwealth of Faith. What a joy and a blessed delight it is for me to be privileged to travel across the miles and to come here and share with you as you conclude this uh, session. And I want to uh, express my profound sense of gratitude to your distinguished president and to you for the high honor and for the great privilege you me by inviting me to come and to share with you. And the little time that I have already been among you, my own soul has already been marvelously blessed Amen. by the fervent manner of the worship experience which has gone before us. And it is my prayer and hope that the same spirit which has prevailed up to this moment will take charge from henceforth, and that all that we say and do will be done and said to the glory and honor of our God and of our Christ. It is a blessing to be able to have this opportunity as well to fraternize with your distinguished president. Uh, he and I uh, came into these uh, respective responsibilities around the same time, but uh, in progressive we have tenure. And uh, so my tenure has come and gone even though I tried to convince them that tenure means continue. Uh, they they, they told me that my time was up. But you are blessed to have the continued leadership of this great man of God. Celebrate your tenure. <laughs> I want to uh, thank Dr. Jemison for those uh, very kind words of introduction. Dr. Jemison is my friend. My friends are given to hyperbole. Uh, and so I want to thank him for his kind words. I'm delighted not only to see him as a fellow progressive, to see Dr. Stevens, and uh, I'm honored by their presence that they would pull apart from the busy rush of their own lives to share with us in this session. I come before you humbly, seeking and soliciting your prayers that God will will bless our coming together, and that somehow something will be said that will encourage you, that will strengthen you, and shed light upon your path as you make your way through time to do traffic in eternity. Will you bow on me and pray with me just now? Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of thy grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and that my will be lost in thine. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, in the Divine Library in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 14, and I begin reading at verse 13. In the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 14, I begin reading at verse 13. When Jesus heard of it, that is, the death of John the Baptist, when Jesus heard of the death of John the Baptist, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth, and he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves buildings. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart, give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and he broke, 
and he gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat that they were filled, and they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about five thousand men besides the women and children. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. You may be seated. Yes, sir. Right. And the disciples said, send them away. And Jesus said, they need not depart. And when he had sent the multitudes away. And the disciples said, send them away. Jesus said, they need not depart. Yes, sir. And when he had sent the multitudes All right, away. All right, sir. And I want to talk with you for a moment here about knowing when to give the benediction. No spiritually sensitive soul can read through the sacred pages of the Bible without recognizing that a tension has always existed between established institutional religion and the free flowing spirit of God. From the days of Amos, when God declared to his chosen people that I hate and despise your feasts, all the way to that fateful Friday when Jesus was finally executed by the established church, this tug of war between institutional religion and the spirit of God has dominated our religious life. At base, the problem seems to be centered around what we think worship is and what God wants our worship to be. We think worship is embodied in our order of service and in our projects and programs, but no matter how spirited our services or impressive our projects, God is always more interested in the content of our heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. A broken and contrite heart, these God will not despise. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. All right. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Only him who has clean hands and a pure heart. Pure heart religion is the only kind God is interested in, yeah. and yet we can go through our ritual week after week and year after year, and our heart not be in it. We get excited about the intensity of our praise, but God gets excited about the sincerity of our praise. We get excited about the screaming in our singing, but God gets excited about the spirit in our singing. We get excited about our order of service, yeah but God gets excited about our order of life. No matter how well we execute our ritual, God is only interested in the content of our heart. Institutional religion can often seem cold and heartless because it always seems to want to limit God to a clock. Ritual demands that we start at a certain time and that we end at a reasonable time, but the Spirit of God does not always have regard for our clock. An emphasis on the clock means that our emphasis is on execution. Yep, exactly. But an emphasis on the spirit means that our emphasis is on an experience. Yeah. And real worship, my brothers and sisters, real worship is really all about an experience. Real worship is a rendezvous with divinity. Come on when we come to this place, we ought not be so interested in getting through so much as we are in getting a breakthrough. When we come to this place, we ought not be so interested in getting finished so much as we are in getting in touch. When God shows up, when God shows up, he doesn't want to be rushed and bumped around from item to item like an insertion point on a computer screen. When God shows up, he wants to make his presence felt. He wants to linger for a little while and enjoy the praises of his people. When God shows up, he wants to hang around just long enough to bless our lives. All right. All right, Not now. too long, but long enough to warm up cold hearts. Not too long, but long enough to soothe grieving spirits. Not too long, but long enough to regulate my functioning mind. 
not too long, but long enough to let us know that we get in this presence. When the ceremony is ended and when the instruments are silent, when the worshipers recess to their residences, then somebody ought to go home saying, surely the Lord was in this place. But also often we get so fixated on our execution that we fail to have an experience. And so there is a tension between execution of worship and an experience in worship. In an execution-centered worship, then we are in charge. But in an experience-centered worship, then God is in charge. And also often we are not sensitive enough to the Spirit of God to simply allow Him to be in charge. In fact, that's one of the major issues of our lives. The truth be told, there are a whole lot of us who have control issues. Look over the vast landscape of your life, or better still, take a biopsy of your closest social relationships. And then when you cut it, everything seems to be out of control. We got a president who's out of control. Racism is on the rise because racist attitudes are out of control. It's not safe to walk down the street anywhere because criminal behavior is out of control. Every aspect of our lives seems to be out of control, and we feel like we ought to be in control somewhere. And so because God is invisible, and you can only see him by squeezing some faith drops in your eyes, and this control issue gets played out in our worship life. And that's bad, my brothers and sisters. That's bad. Because if you can't trust God in the worship, then you can't trust Him anywhere else. If you can't trust God in the worship, then you won't trust Him at home. If you can't trust God in the worship, then you won't trust Him on the job. If you can't trust God in the worship, then you won't trust Him anywhere else. Our lives seem to be out of control because we don't know how to relax and trust and just let God be in control. All right, sir. Believe it or not, God does have our best interest at heart, but satanic brainwashing tactics have deceived us into believing that we've been left on our own to do everything for ourselves. Now, to be sure, there are some things that you have to do for yourself. You got to brush your own teeth. You got to wash your own armpits. You got to put on your own shoes. But aside from these minor details of life, for the major issues of our lives, then God has left us an instruction manual. In fact, to do the things that you have to do for yourself, you have to believe that if you go to sleep at night, then God will at least wake you up in the morning. And the mere fact that he tiptoes down the steps of eternity every morning, peeks in on me and wakes me up right on time, starts me on my way, walks with me through my day, makes it eligible for some praise. But we have this control problem. <laughs> and so this tension exists. Uh, for some reason, we feel like if we could just harness the spirit, if we could control the flow of the spirit, if we could enjoy the gradual swell of the spirit yeah. and then cut it off before it erupts into an ecstatic explosion of praise and we lose control, then we don't mind the spirit. But when the spirit is in control, then we don't know what to expect. We might end up laughing and no joke has been told. We might end up crying and nobody has died. We might end up running and nobody shooting at us. We might even end up loving somebody we don't even like. When the spirit is in control, then we're afraid that we might act crazy and undignified and uncharacteristic. And then worst of all, that we might end up staying too long. And staying too long is a problem for institutional religion. It's not so much how we start out, so much as it is how we end up. It's not so much the processional and the praise period and all of that. For some reason, it's just a benediction. We can start late. We can arrive after the appointed hour. We can raise our black Baptist finger and tiptoe down the aisle and zero box seats in the front. And none of that gets to be a problem. It's when we stay past the time, when the Spirit says, repeat that praise, when the Spirit says, hold that note, when it seems like the benediction is never going to get pronounced, then institutional religion starts having a problem. 
after a certain point, we'll start looking at our watches. We get all fidgety and restless. We yawn so we can show everybody our new false teeth. <laughs> we're almost inclined to stretch out and go to sleep on the pew. And we start complaining to each other that we're staying too long. And as a consequence, many times we're coming to church and going home feeling like we haven't even been in church. And the reason is we're coming to church, but we aren't coming to worship. Our lives are not being blessed because we're giving the benediction too soon. When we gather to worship, we're not gathering to zip through an order of service. We're gathering to experience the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is in this place. The presence of the Lord is around here. It's not enough just for God to be here. Before he leaves here, he wants to bless our lives. That's why when our old mothers and fathers got together, they didn't have all of this carpet and this cushion, all of this electricity we got. Uh, they would just get around and they would hum around. And they would moan around. And they would stomp around. And somebody would say, somebody needs you, Lord. Uh, so come by here. Uh, somebody's heard you, Lord. Uh, so come by here. But we're giving the benediction before we give God a chance to meet our needs. It's good church. In fact, God's been so good, you ought to be here every time the door opens. But now, before you leave here, then you ought to at least learn to give the benediction. Well, as a skill as it might seem, this is the lesson that Jesus is teaching his disciples in the background of this text. In the background here, John the Baptist has been beheaded, and upon hearing this distressing news, Jesus is just so crushed and so hurt that he simply found it necessary to get away to a desert place to grieve alone. And just let me press the pause button here just long enough to say to you, my brothers and sisters, that that's what I love and that's what I like about our Savior. We have a Savior who has been touched with all of our infirmities. Jesus knows what it is to grieve. But John the Baptist was his cousin. John the Baptist was his best friend. John the Baptist had introduced him to the world with that classic introduction, Behold the Lamb of God. And so when Jesus heard that he was dead in the horrible manner by which he died, he was simply so crushed that he found it necessary to get away to a desert place to grieve alone. And I don't know what you're going through in here tonight, but I do want you to know that whatever it is, you ought to leave here with the blessed assurance bubbling over in your bosom that Jesus understands. If you're grieving, he understands. If you're lonely, he understands. If you feel rejected and dejected and busted and disgusted and like a motherless child a long ways from home, Jesus understands. Whatever you're going through, Jesus understands because we have a Savior who has been touched with all of our infirmities. When Jesus got away to this desert place to grieve alone, but when the people heard where he was, then they went out to be with him. And the church must ever bear in mind that people are looking for Jesus. Ain't nobody looking for you. People are looking for Jesus. They are not looking for a show. Uh, they're not looking for an outside performance for this old unfriendly world. Uh, people are looking for Jesus. And wherever Jesus is, people will eventually find him. If they have to leave your church and run off and find him on their own. Uh, they found him. He went by ship and they walked and ran. So don't tell me transportation is a problem. If you want to see Jesus badly enough, you'll find a way to get to him. If you have to, you'll walk, or you'll run, or you'll hop, or you'll skip. Uh, one old lady had been sick for 12 long years, but she wanted to see Jesus so bad that she got down on all fours and crawled. So transportation really ain't a problem when you want to see Jesus. Uh, the people found him. And true and typical to his nature, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. 
He was so engrossed in meeting their needs that it took all day. Uh, the blue sky of the noon day had turned gray. The fiery blaze of the golden sun had grown dim. The haunting shadows of the evening had stretched forth her arms and began to embrace the vernal earth. And the disciples just felt like this was long enough. And so now it was time to give the benediction. They came to Jesus and said, now look here, Master. Now, now look, now, this, this is a desert place and, and it's late, it's getting dark out here. And these people's been out here all day now and they're tired and they're hungry, so send them away. Uh, Jesus said, no, 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 hold up, dogs, now, no, don't send them away. Uh, now look, I know you just getting started out with me on this redemption mission, hmm? but I don't want you to start out here now by giving me no bad reputation. I need you to know up front that when hungry folks are in my presence, I don't send them away hungry. If they're hungry, you feed them. Institutional religion, institutional religion is always trying to hurry up and find a reason to give the benediction. Just look at this finely crafted statement of reasons why they said it was time to give the benediction. They said this is a desert place. In other words, ain't nothing here for them. Uh, this is a desert place. There are no life-giving and life-supporting efforts going on here, for this is a desert place. And unfortunately, that's some people's estimate of their own church. After all of the preaching and praying, after all of the singing and praising, after all of the effort to develop a life-empowering ministry, all some folks can see and say is this is a desert place. For some folks, I don't care what you do. You've done all you can do. You still ain't done nothing. Uh, Jesus had transformed this desert place into a mini metropolis. Uh, thousands were there. He had transformed this desert place into an emergency room. He had healed their sick. Uh, but none of that connected in their minds. All they could see and say is this is a desert place. But you know, I've got some late breaking news here that says Jesus can transform a desert place into whatever it needs to be in order to meet the needs of his people. Fact is, ain't no such thing as a desert place if Jesus is there. But they said this is a desert place. They said the time is now past. In other words, they said it's late, Jesus. Now look here, man, we've been here all day. Uh, now that's long enough. It's getting dark out here, so send them away. And there is a mentality that thinks that the church ought to shut down and bed down and lock up at night. But thanks be to God, we got a 24-hour Savior who neither slumbers nor sleeps. I don't know about you, but I'm glad. I'm glad we got a God who just ain't in the blessing business from 9 to 5. I'm glad we got a God who ain't got one of them new automated answering machines that kicks in after five. Hello, uh, you've reached heaven. Uh, I'm sorry no one is available to take your call. If you wish to leave a message for the Father, press one. If you wish to leave a message for the Son, press two. If you wish to leave a message for the Holy Ghost, press three. I'm glad we got a God that will come at 3 in the morning if that's what I need. It's no wonder. It's no wonder that the devil does most of his destructive work at night. The tired old sleepy church is gone to me. And ain't no army on the battlefield for my Lord. God's people need to be organized to fight sin on a 24-hour basis. What they said is late, so send them away. They said, let them meet their own needs. If they're hungry, it ain't our job to feed them. Ain't nobody told them to come out here in the first place. If they're hungry, let them go on somewhere and try and something to eat. But this is the picture of a selfish church. These disciples tried to disguise their bed of concern for people behind their concern for themselves. Jesus said, no, no, no. If they're hungry, don't send them away. If they're hungry, you feed them. And so Jesus is trying to teach us here that you don't ever give the benediction until the people's needs have been met. 
Institutional religion better wake up and hear that. Institutional religion is dying out everywhere because we're sending hungry folk away because we won't feed them. Sending lonely folk away because we won't fellowship with them. Sending sick folk away because we don't heal them. We need to learn when to give the benediction. Now, come here and observe this text and see here first of all that it teaches us that you don't give the benediction until you allow God to use you to work a miracle. Now when the disciples told Jesus to send this multitude away, then Jesus' response was, you feed them. He was trying to teach them that the church is in the business of meeting the needs of people. Now the problem is all of us hear that, and all of us know that, but no matter how much we say we believe it, we just don't act on it. There are a whole lot of us who've been in church virtually all of our lives, had all this old dead formality so ingrained in us that we don't think in terms of meeting anybody's needs but our own. That's all these disciples were doing. They weren't thinking about those people, they were thinking about themselves. And so Jesus said, take your mind off yourself and fix your mind on human needs. But Jesus was trying to change their perception of themselves. He wanted them to see themselves as somebody that God can use to work a miracle. And that's the opportunity that Jesus gives all of us. Jesus gives all of us the opportunity to develop a new self-concept. He wants us to see ourselves differently from the way the world has programmed us to see ourselves. We run around here thinking of ourselves as an officer. But Jesus don't want you to think of yourself as no officer. Jesus wants you to think of yourself as a minister. I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you healed me. We need to stop looking at all of this televangelist on TV. We call ourselves trying to learn how to have church and go somewhere and get down on our hands and knees and learn how to be the church. Listen, God can use you to work a miracle. He can use you to make the crooked way straight. He can use you to straighten out a way with life. He can use you to get somebody on straight street. God can use you to work a miracle. You don't need no PhD in counseling to help straighten out a confused soul. Jesus is a wonderful counselor. And if you put your arm around him and speak to that spirit in the name of Jesus, then you can help straighten out a confused soul. God wants to use you to work a miracle. You know, some of them old songs, some of them old songs we used to sing, we don't sing no more. Uh, but some of them old songs was pretty good songs. And one of them songs said, if I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can just cheer somebody with a word or a song, if I can show somebody where he's going wrong, then my living will not be in vain. My living will not be in vain. If I can wipe tears from a baby's face, if I can help an aging saint remember the lines of amazing grace, if I can show some lost person how to find their place, then my living will not be in vain. God wants to use you to work a miracle. But see here in the second instance that this text teaches us that you don't give the benediction until you let God bless your little bit. Now, now, uh, now, 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 when, when Jesus when Jesus commanded these disciples to feed this hungry multitude, then I imagine their first impulse was to direct some choice expletives at Jesus. Now, hmm, 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 Jesus, now, now we've been here all day and we didn't expect all these peoples to be here and we didn't prepare no bad lunches because we didn't know we was going on a picnic and there ain't no Mickey D's and there ain't no Burger King in the vicinity. Now, now, in terms of the bare bones of the text, that's not what they see it. But then knowing human nature, as I've come to understand it, is not out of the realm of possibility. No, in terms of the bare bones of the text, that's not what they see it. But in terms of our hermeneutical logic, they reason the institution. You see, Jesus said, you feed them. 
And then out of their institutional mindset, they started calculating their available resources. They said, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Jesus, now, look here, all we got is just little five loaves and two fishes. All we got is just a little bit, and it ain't enough to feed all these people. Now, 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 this same story, this same story is recorded over in John's gospel. And see, according to John's version of the story, there was a little brother from the hood that was in the crowd that was the one that had five loaves and two fish. Now, you see, this could create a controversy. Did the disciples have the five loaves and two fish, or did the little brother from the hood have the five loaves and two fish? You see, in Matthew, the disciples said, we have here, but then in John's version of the gospel, they said, there's a lad here who has. You see what Matthew's trying to tell us? Matthew's trying to tell us that institutional religion is always trying to steal God's glory. You see, the disciples sensed that a miracle was about to jump off, and they wanted to get credit for it. And a whole lot of us around here patting ourselves on the back, trying to steal God's glory. Listen, he's given you the blessing. Go on, give him the glory. He did better to you than your food self. Go on, give him the glory. He woke you up this morning and start you on the way. Go on, give him the glory. Now see again. Now again, according to John's version of the gospel, there was a little brother from the hood that was in the crowd. That was the one that had the five loaves and two fish. So you have to, God uses people to bless people. And so you got to be careful about her up giving the benediction. So you don't ever know who God has sent up in here that's got the elements for your miracle in their pocket. You better pray for a little while. You better praise him for a little while. You better call on his name for a little while. Uh, what if Jesus had sent this multitude away? Uh, but no, he charmed the imagination of Peter, James, and John and his disciples in every century by reminding us that he could still feed you in a desert place. Now, I know your checking account might be empty. You may never have had a savings account. But he sent me by here tonight just to remind you that he can still provide your every need, even in a desert place. Uh, your husband might have left you. And you got to rid them children all by yourself. But he wants me to let you know you can still depend on him, even in a desert place. Uh, your job might have been outsourced, and you still got that mortgage and all them bills to pay. But he wants me to remind you that he's Jehovah Joseph, even in a desert place. Uh, they were in a desert place. Uh, they were in a deserted place. Uh, but Jesus was there. And so he said to his disciples, you feed them. Uh, 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 the disciples start to get a little testy with Jesus. What Jesus, now we done told you, all we got is just here a little bit. Uh, why look, one, two, three. There are 13 of us. And this little bit we got here, why that ain't even enough for us. See, institutional religion is always trying to determine what can and what can't be done based on how little or how much we have. But Jesus was about to run out of long suffering. And so I saw him when he slapped his hands together. Said to his disciples, stop looking down at the bottom of that greasy bag. And look up here on my adorable face. And you'll see the greatest asset. And you running around here counting pennies and nickels and dimes. But don't you know I own the cattle on a thousand hills and the hills of mine also? You looking at the bottom of the balance sheet. But don't you know I'm the one that balances the books? Uh, just bring me your little bit. You must not know who I am. One day I came from nothing. I stepped tiptoe up on nothing. I reached way back into nowhere and grabbed a handful of nothing. And I flung out everything. Wall Street jitters don't give me the blue. I don't care if Trump is in the White House. I'm still on the throne. Just bring me the little bit. I see these disciples. I see them when they shifted their institutional mindset. I see them when they grudgingly thrust their little lunch in the master's hand. And the word is that he took it and he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples and the disciples to the people. 
You see, the one that's always so sure that nothing can be done yeah. is one who ain't never took no time out to get a little something, something out of the master's hand. Don't you know he got 10,000 blessings in his right hand? That's why in the morning before you put your feet on the floor, you need to put your knees on the floor, reach over into eternity, and pluck yourself a blessing out of the master's hand. What you need? You need a little joy? A God's got it. Need hope for tomorrow? God's got it. Need a way out of no way? God's got it. Need healing for your body? God's got it. Whatever you need. Whatever you need, God's got it. Now, now, now this next part, this next part is the part I don't understand. Uh, see, I'm not a good math student anyway. And uh, this is heaven's arithmetic. See, this is, this is divine division. Uh, see, I can't figure this part out. See, what I can't figure out is did it add and then multiply and divide, or did it divide and then add and multiply? Uh, see, this is divine division. All I know is when it got through, we had more left over than it started out with. There is no failure in God. There is no shortage in God. When Jesus got finished that day, not only had everybody eaten enough, but they had 12 baskets full of left over. One basket for each disciple. Every time you saw Peter, James, and John after that, they was down on skid row trying to get some bomb of fish set. 12 baskets full. Not only will it fill you up in here, but he'll give you a praise dog in back to go. You get your praise on in here. When you get home, you can take your clothes off, wrap your arms around the old black set, and keep on praising his name. Twelve baskets full. One basket to remind you that he'll take care of you every month in the year. In January, in February, in March, in April, back again. Twelve baskets full. Y'all got the excuse me, but I'm full right now. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I walk the floor. But come here, see here in the final instance, that this text teaches us that the meeting ain't over until Jesus says it's over. The hungry masses were full. They had dined on the word. They had dined on the fish. And so now the master sent the multitude away. Uh, he first sent his disciples on the way, sort of as an advanced team. So they had laid some groundwork in another place by visitation for the master. Uh, every time you leave this place, you ought to be trying to lay proper groundwork. An institutional religion, so proud of itself, every time the Lord does show up, we want to pat ourselves on the back and talk about this here was a great day. But you know, I've been on this journey long enough now to know that every day with Jesus is a great day. Every time we gather, we all be laying proper ground with it. God wants to visit your church, but you've got to lay proper ground with it. God wants to visit your pew, but you've got to lay proper groundwork. God wants to bless your ministry, but you've got to lay proper groundwork. Prayer is groundwork. Praising is groundwork. Calling on his name is groundwork. And you must always know that the meeting ain't over until Jesus says it's over. Somebody got to be healed before you get a victory. Somebody's head got to be lifted up before you give the benediction. Uh, the word is that he sent the multitudes away. And then he went up to a mountain, a park to pray. And while he was on that mountain, he wanted more power to meet every human need. And while he was on that mountain, he saw that our greatest need was a need for salvation. And so on the mountain, they laid him on the ground. On the mountain, they drove nails in his hand. 
on the mountain they pierced him in his side. I saw him that Friday afternoon when he dropped his holy head in the locks of his shoulders. I saw the Roman soldiers when they took his holy body down and they laid your Lord and mine on the cold, cold ground. I saw the devil when he kicked the body got on his cell phone, called to death, and said, get a hearse from hell and come pick up the body. I saw death when he called the grave and said, guess who I got? The grave said, if you get in here, I'll keep it for you. I saw death and the devil high five. Demons were dancing. Poor gods were rejoicing. But somewhere between Saturday midnight and where they Sunday morning, Jesus opened his eyes and he said to the devil, give me the key. The devil said, don't embarrass me before my demons. Jesus said, I said, give me the key. And he took the key and he got up with all power. In his hand, he's got the power to see you through. He's got the power to grow your church. He's got the power to save your soul. I know it's late. You've been here all week. Uh, but before I take my seat, I have to have a spiritual checkup. Have you been helped? Have you been encouraged? Have you been inspired? Don't fool me now. In that case, I'll give the benediction. Now I want to him. Who's able to keep you from starting? Now I want to him. Who's able to keep you from falling? Yeah. Now one day here, yeah. be glory yeah. and majesty yeah. and honor. Yeah. Oh, praise his name. Yeah. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Won't he do it? Yeah. Won't he make your way? Yeah. Won't he pick you up? Yeah. Won't he turn you around? Yeah. Say yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. the right benediction. Certainly, before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died, He gave the benediction. But He bought our souls by way of the cross. What a blessing that He did not leave his business unfinished but made sure that he took care of his business which was our business that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us listen the text that our preacher preached about dealt with us being filled physically but Jesus can fill you the way no food can fill you and if you're here today, you might have come empty. But even tonight, you can leave full. You might be here not knowing where your source or your salvation will come from. But it will come from, it only comes from Jesus the Christ. He came that you may have life and have life more abundantly. And if you're here today, my brother, my sister, why don't you come? If you're here today, why don't you come? If you're here today, why don't you come? If you're here today, why don't you come?
get to know him tonight, come on, if you would confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, you shall be saved. Why don't you come? for the message and the messenger. We praise God for Dr. Perkins for such an inspirational message. In the absence of Vice President Glenn, I'm going to ask that our treasurer, Dr. F.D. Sampson, would come and lead us in worship and giving. To our president and vice presidents, to all of the officers of the parent body and auxiliaries and boards, as well as commissions, to you, my brothers and sisters, good evening. We have come to the last offering for the 2019 Midwinter Board. The National Baptist Convention of America Incorporated uh, International Incorporated and we do want to leave knowing that we've done our best am I right there and so I'm going to ask you to prepare the best offering that you can for this last offering of this 2019 Midwinter Board meeting here in the Alamo City, San Antonio, Texas. Amen. I hope that you have been blessed this week. I believe you have. I hope that you have been inspired. I hope that you have gleamed and gained uh, from these sessions this week all of which has been presented through the programming of this convention. Um, if you eat at a restaurant, if you eat at a restaurant, you will no doubt be presented a bill. If you exit from the restaurant without paying the bill, you run the risk of being apprehended, arrested, indicted, convicted, and Reverend Dixon says in Baptist. This is no restaurant. However, we have dined sufficiently. Am I right there? Amen. I'm going to ask as many as who can, do not complain if you cannot. Do not murmur if you cannot. But if you can, I'm going to ask you to join me in this last offering tonight. I'm going to begin with $100. This last offering of the Midwinter Board meeting here in the Alamo City, 
San Antonio, Texas, at the Antioch Baptist Church, 1001 North Walter Street. Amen with the Reverend Dr. Kenneth Kemp is the pastor. We have been wonderfully entertained or hosted. Am I right there? And uh, the Lord is, thank you there. Thank you, Brother Pastor. Pastor Brown, Pastor Delbert Brown of the Concord Baptist Church, Clarksville, Tennessee. And the Reverend Bobby Showers of the Roseland Baptist Church over in Hammond. Amen. President Talbot, Dr. Kemp, thank you so much. If you are writing a check, please make it payable to National Baptist or you can make it payable to NBCA. We have some OHBCU fund money from the Guadalupe District Association. The Reverend Lee A. Williams is the moderator. Am I right there? Is that right? Huh? The Reverend Lee A. Williams of the Wheaton Heights First Baptist Church here in San Antonio, and he's also given $100. There's Dr. Roy Bracken. There's Dr. Robert Alexander. That's a stir. A hundred dollars. Amen. About the dollar of Banks of Tampa, Florida. Our general secretary, the Reverend Shelton Charles Dixon. Of the, hmm? Dr. Joel Taylor. Amen. Of the, hmm? Dr. Snelly Simpson, both of Chicago. There's Dr. William Daly. hundred dollars. Amen. That's Dr. B Dr. Bathu. Bathi. Hmm? Bathia. Amen. 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 New Jersey. There's Amen, Dr. Giles. And Brother Johnny Glenn Anderson. Amen. There's Dr. Azariah Wesley Anthony Mays with the Mount Sunny Baptist Church, 5900 Cameron Road, Austin, Texas. And here is, amen, WIA of the National Convention, $100. Sister Anderson is the president. And here is Brother Foreign Star Lawton. $100 president of our brotherhood. I'm trying to hold this up because this is, this is HBCU money. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> Who? Who, Reverend Ricky Farrell? All right, of the greater... New Mount Bethel, huh? Don't confuse me now. <laughs> Reverend Ricky Farrell. Reverend Ricky Farrell. Yeah, that's it. Dr. Cox, $100. Now let me get this, Reverend Ricky Farrell. We're New Bethel, 601, 99th Street, Inglewood, California. Who is this now? <laughs> Reverend. Give the fire. All right, I'll get the email on that. <laughs> you understand? And who else? Dr. Terrence Grant Malone at the St. John Baptist Church on Darling. Well, emancipation now. A hundred dollars. Amen. Are there others? I'm sorry, correction. The check I previously announced from the WIA was from the SWMU, Sister Dr. Barbara Wright, President. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that correction. All right, are there others? Dr. Delbert Mack of Tabernacle, Beaumont, Texas, Cathedral of Faith. Amen. Thank you, sir. He's going to bring it. He's good for his wood. All right, anybody else want to try? give us your wood? All right, thank you so very much. You didn't have 100, but you've got 50. You've got $50, and you're willing to give that. Are there any who have $50? Dr. Earl Alfred Pleasant, 
past pastor and emeritus pastor of the Great New Bethel Baptist Church, past vice president of this convention. Amen. He's a retired gentleman. Amen. All right, there's Dr. Brandon Dumas, vice president of Wiley College, Waco, Texas. No, Marshall, Texas. Wiley College. I'll get it straight. Dr. Hattie Weed, director of our music from the Galilee Baptist Church, 1500 Pierre, Freeport, Louisiana. Amen. Thank you. The Reverend Robert Hall, our registrar. I was just seeing if you were listening. Dr. Lord Barnett Hall III, our registrar of the St. Luke Baptist Church, Dallas, Texas. All right, on Victoria. All right, thank you so very much. There comes Sister Dot, my other daughter, Sister Dorothy Mays Clark. Amen. $50. There's the Reverend Demetrius Kleiss of the Philadelphia. Is it New Philadelphia or Old Philadelphia? Hmm? Original Philadelphia Baptist Church, Chicago, Illinois. Thank you so much. This is the last offering, amen, that we'll be receiving for this session. All right, you didn't have 100, you didn't have 50, but you've got 20. You've got $20, and you're willing to give it tonight in this last offering. There come right on, my brother from Tennessee. Amen. Amen. There you are, Sister Archangel. There you are. Amen, Sister Carnes. There you are, there you are, come right on, come right on. You've got $20 and you're willing to give it in this offering tonight. Thank you so very much. Amen, thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. There you are, there you are. Thank you so very much. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, Brother Blunt's got some money here, come get it please. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. There you are. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't have the 100. You didn't have the 50. You didn't have the 20. But you've got 10. You've got $10. You've got $10. Would you please come bring it now? $10. You've got... We'll get a vessel. Who? Mr. Lock Boren, $100. Thank you. Yeah, we need a vessel. Thank you so much. Hope you got some hundreds, fifties, twenties, and tens. Amen. I'm sorry, I didn't look back here when I said that, but I was talking to y'all. I know y'all got some hundreds, y'all got some fifties, y'all got some twenties, y'all got some tens, y'all got some blessed. All right, all right now. You have moved on the 100, you didn't have the 100, you didn't have the 50, nor the 20, nor the 10, but you've got $5, and we'd like for you to come and bring it now. $5 or, 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 or less. Won't you come and bring it? If you have an offering, come on, bring it now, please. Amen, amen. Please come. Dr. Frank Garden, how much? $100 from my Vice President, Dr. Frank Gordon of the 14th Avenue Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee. Amen. Thank you so much. All right, now it's your time to move. If you haven't moved, do you want to move now, please? Please move, please move, please come, please bring your offering. If you haven't moved yet, please move now. Thank you so much. Your offering is important. Your offering is important. Please move now if you haven't moved, bringing your offering. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Get this, get this, get this, get this, get this, get this, get this. The Lord is blessing me right now. Everybody, Lord, right now. Oh, Lord, in life. Right now. Oh, right now. He woke me up this morning and he started on my way. Oh, the Lord, everybody blessing me right now. And you say that one more time, the Lord. You know he is right now. Oh, right now. Oh, the Lord. Yes, sir. He's blessed. Sing it, sing it. Right now. Oh, right now. Tell me what he did. What else did he do? Now testify The Lord Is blessing me Right now Sound like church to me Come on here One more time Yeah, right now Oh, right Oh, the Lord Is blessing uh, Right now Oh, right Where he walked me He woke me up this morning. I wasn't cold in my right mind. Oh, he didn't let me sleep too late. But he woke me up on time. Our Father, we thank you for your blessings and ask that you will please continue your blessings upon us. Bless everyone who's given this offering. Please bless this offering according to your purpose, your will, and your pleasure. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Lord is blessing me. Ah, blessing me. Send me
At this time, I'm going to ask now that Dr. Barbara Wright, president of our senior women's ministry, would come and express our gratitude to this host church, host pastor, and host committee, host city, in an official way on behalf of our president and our convention. My assigned task is that of expressing our profound appreciation to you, Dr. Kemp, and all of the co-host pastors, my homeboy, Reverend Daly, the Reverend L. A. Williams, Reverend Kevin Nelson, and if I'm, if I'm omitting anyone, that's it. And to this church, Amen. the Antioch Amen. Missionary Baptist Church. Amen. To you, Lady Kemp. come to announce to you that we find you guilty. Amen. We find you guilty of giving us the best entertainment. Amen. You started at the airport. You're guilty. As we stepped down to the, and those of us who were in wheelchairs, rolled down to the baggage area. There was there, some, there was someone there to greet us. Beautiful smiles saying, welcome, National Baptist Convention of America to San Antonio. You're guilty. When we arrived at the hotel, a crowd saying to us, welcome, to San Antonio from this church. Amen. When we arrived here on Monday, Amen. it was like a, I don't want to say wall, it was, it was a wall of folk yeah. on each side saying, welcome, we're so happy to have you here. Then when we got to the door, someone was there to open the door with a smile and say, welcome. Amen. We find you guilty. No mediocrity. We find you guilty. So when you're guilty, we've deliberated. Our Honorable Judge Samuel C. Tolbert, Jr., our bailiff, Bailiff Dixon, now your bonds, bail bombman won't be able to help you tonight, bondsman Samson. Matter of fact, he's left. <laughs> Therefore, I, as your jewelry form, say to you tonight that you and the co-host pastors and the loving Antioch Church are guilty of giving us some of the best entertaining and hosting that we have ever had. Hosted us with love. They so, showed so much joy in doing it. So much exhilaration and excitement. The food was superb. The courtesy car drivers were outstanding. Now, when you are found guilty, have to pay. 
So, this is what we're saying to you. You're charged, found guilty, and you know what you're gonna have to do? Bring us back. <laughs> I say to you tonight, on behalf of our beloved president and the member churches from every state, we say to you, thank you so much for your excellent entertainment. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Wright, for that eloquent expression of our gratitude. Our gracious president has deferred to one of the pioneers and pillars of our convention, the person of the Pastor Emeritus Earl Pleasant, to come and provide to us presidential remarks. Let's receive him with a great amen. Amen. Thank you to our presiding president, to our president of this great body, and to all of his officers and members of this great convention, to this great college of clergy that shares the rostrum and this uh, opportunity with me. The one thing I have a problem with is I don't know how to ever speak for the president. I'm gracious that he would allow me to have this opportunity to say a few words, but uh, it's hard to speak for a president of the magnitude of Dr. Samuel Talbert, Jr. And so I'm, I'm just here, and as I think about uh, what's been happening this week, I think about the psalmist David, who penned the words, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would have been. My sister put music to that song, Dr. Duro, and it helped you to kind of understand it a little better when you have music to words that you really endeared. And so uh, I'm here tonight, and I'm just grateful, first of all, to our entertaining pastor, Dr. Kim, Thank you so much for all you have done in entertaining us this week. We are tremendously blessed. Uh, everything has just been over and above board. I, I, I don't think anyone can leave here this week and say they have not been blessed from the entertainment committee and then from the convention program. We have heard some mighty good preaching this week, haven't we? And I still think it's too early to give the benediction. I think we need another round of this because that message really in, 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 entrenched my heart. You can't leave until you be blessed by the Lord. And you know what? Uh, I, I take that to heart for the idea is that you just don't know when the Lord is going to show up. He might show up while you're running and taking your time getting here during devotional period. The Lord might show up. And again, he might show up when you leave early before the benediction. And so we need to learn what God has in store for us and not leave before we get that blessing. And I praise God for that message tonight. And all the preachers who preached, Reverend Jamal Witherspoon on Monday and Reverend uh, Glenn on last night and then tonight, we've been blessed by some powerful preaching. I'm grateful and then I'm through. I'm grateful tonight to have uh, my sons in the ministry here. I have uh, my pastor, Reverend Ricky Farrell, Stan Brother Farrell. That's my pastor now who pastors the Greater New Bethel Church. Then I have my son, Reverend Terrell Bird, and Reverend Ronji Nixon standing there. They live in here in San Antonio. 
And that just goes to show you that the Greater New Bethel Factor will be continuing with this convention for years to come. I'm grateful to have them uh, to stand in my shoes because uh, now we have to turn it over to this millennium crowd, amen. They are around to take us forward. So my words tonight in behalf of our president, thank you all for being here. Thank the host church and pastor for their kind services rendered to us. I'm glad to see all of my friends, uh, Dr. Simpson from the Evangelical Board and Dr. Um, um, Dennis Jones from the Foreign Mission Board. I, I'm glad to see Sister Hattie Wade, my sister. Love you, Sister Wade. She told me to show to tell you hello. And then uh, all the others. I can't call everybody's name, but I'm grateful for those of you who I've been able to be blessed by. Years ago, when I first started attending this convention, Dr. E. Edward Jones, Dr. Albert Chu, and Dr. Freddie Dunn, uh, because they had love for my father, they took me up under their wing. And they nurtured me through the convention, whereas Dr. Dunn uh, asked me to be the chairman of the evangelical board. I moved from there, and Dr. Thurston asked me to be a vice president. And now our president asked me to be an advisor to the president. Now, if you, if you heard all the work that he's doing this week, he don't need my little advice. <laughs> but I share with him those things that I can, and I'm grateful that he has also endeared me and my church and my church family and my personal family. God bless you, God keep you, and thank you for all that we have seen and experienced this week. Our General Secretary, Pastor Dixon is coming with our announcements, and then we'll have a benediction by our speaker for tonight, uh, uh, Pres President Perkins. Our President, Brother Presider, Cabinet of Officers, National Baptist Convention of America, International Incorporated, and all who are in this house tonight. Just a few announcements. State Presidents and Moderators, please see Third Vice President, Reverend Dr. Napoleon Smith, following the benediction of this worship tonight. Uh, he has a packet for you, so please see him before you leave. DVDs of all services are available for the cost of $10 and they have also made available for us CDs of all of these services since we started Monday night and the CDs are $7 so brothers and sisters let's not have Antioch do all of this for us and then they hold all those DVDs and CDs for themselves. Let's purchase them, please. If you purchased an ad for the souvenir booklet, your complimentary book is in the vestibule. Um, and check this out. Antioch is going to be gracious to us, and we ought to take advantage of this opportunity. The souvenir books now are going for a cost of five dollars. Hello. Now, National Baptist, let's do all we can to make sure that we purchase all of the books they have left helping our host church. Our boards, as I mentioned to us earlier today, are still in need of our assistance. The work and the causes are great but their cash is low. So please, let's help our boards. Dr. Kemp, the host pastor, our friend and our brother has three books. I've been given a message and they are in the vestibule, $15 each. Let's support Dr. Kemp and the work that he has done in putting together books that will help us. We buy everybody else's, 
we ought to buy one from our own. Amen. Late night worship tonight. Word and worship. It will be late night, but it will not be all night. The preacher for tonight, and since I cannot pronounce his name, I'll spell it, is the Reverend Laurent, here's the last name, G-R-O-S-V-E-N-O-R, pastor, y'all know it, pastor of Alpha, Alpha Seventh-day Adventist Church of Austin, Texas. Brother President, Brother Presider, these are the only announcements I have. Let us stand. Since we've had such a wonderful week, I just thought it would be so fitting if we just join in together reverently praise him. received a benediction from Dr. James Perkins, who's challenged us tonight. Yeah. As the 15th president of the National Baptist Convention of America International Incorporated, I now declare that this 2019 Mid-Winter Board and Mini Congress now officially close after the benediction. Let me express again to you my gratitude for the privilege of having been with you, and I pray God's blessings upon all of your work and labor. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your goodness and mercy, how we thank you for your presence of your Holy Spirit that we have felt throughout the length and breadth of this week. And we pray now that as we come to the concluding moments of this week of work and witness, that your spirit will go back with us to our various destinations. Continue to bless this president, continue to lead him and guide him by your spirit, and bless this great people, and use them wherever they live and labor to build up your kingdom. And in all things, we'll be so careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. Through Christ our Lord, we pray and say hallelujah and amen.